Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. It's great to see so many of you tuned in for this part three of our owner series. In the first part, we discussed the buying of super yachts uh, with three very experienced owners. In the second, we talked charter, and today it's the turn of refit. But why are we running this series? Uh, the philosophy of it, I suppose. Well, we have lots of owners watching, so in part, it's about sharing knowledge and best practice. Uh, but we also hope for the industry professionals watching, for the super yacht professionals joining us today, that there's an opportunity to take what you learn here today and apply it to your businesses. Um, it's not often we get three such experienced donors uh, taking part in a live interview like this. Um, my name is Stuart Campbell. I'm the editor-in-chief of Boat International. I'm delighted to be here hosting today's session, which forms part of our ongoing virtual boat show. Uh, we've got some amazing exhibitors over there, so if you haven't had a chance to check it out yet, please do and go and have a look for yourselves. Before we get started, I just want to run through a few housekeeping notes uh, for today's session. Uh, this is being recorded, uh, so if you want to, uh, if you've got a meeting or you need to zip out a bit early, that's absolutely fine. You can watch it on demand a bit later in the week where it will be live, sorry, not live, it will be up uh, on the virtual boat show. Um, yeah, so don't worry if you have to leave early. And parts one and two are also there uh, for you to look at now. Uh, if you'd like to tweet about today's event, please use the hashtag, hashtag boat owners. Um, importantly, we will have time towards the end of the session for questions. Uh, you're able to submit them throughout the conversation. Um, at, the at the bottom of your screen is a chat button. Simply click on that and submit a question. And the team behind the scenes uh, doing all the really hard work uh, we'll pass these on to me and we'll do our best to get as many uh, as we get to as many as we can at the end of the session. So please do. Don't be shy. Uh, any question you want to answer, please fire away and uh, the team will feed those to me and we'll try and get to as many as we can at the end. Meanwhile, if you're having trouble viewing the live stream, please email events at boatinternationalmedia.com. Uh, you can see the email address on your screen now or message the team through the chat feature. Our next session, the last session in this kind of mini-series, will happen on July 30th, uh, my birthday also, and that will be focused on voyage. So we'll have a couple of super owners who have done some amazing journeys in their boats, and we will be examining those and what went into the preparation of them and uh, you know where they went and uh, looking at hopefully some of the photos and videos from those journeys. Um, in the meantime, if you would like to contribute any ideas for future sessions in the owner series, my email address is on screen. So please drop me a line um, and let me know if there's another subject you would like to talk about or hear owners talk about. So without further ado, let's meet our speakers. Uh, Mina Guillon is uh, with us today. She is the owner of the classic CRN yacht Vespucci with her husband. Uh, which was designed by and built for the legend Carlo Riva. She and her husband bought the yacht in 2016 and set about restoring her as faithfully as possible to her original condition. The work was done at Monaco Marine and took about 18 months, which is a huge amount of time to spend on a 30 meter yacht, but the results are absolutely stunning. Please, if you get the opportunity, go to Boat International's website, search for Vespucci, and you can read the great feature one of our writers did about the yacht and see some of the amazing photos uh, for yourself and the great work from the ship. And Mina is actually uh, joining us today from Calvi in Corsica. She's on board for Spucci. Uh, for all of you stuck in offices. Um, <laughs> <laughs> sorry, Mina. Um, Sabina Nasser is the owner of 43 meter Mondo Marine Bina. She and her family bought the yacht in 2014 after starting their search for yachts in the 30 to 35 meter range. Sabina says she knew immediately when stepping on board that Bina was the yacht for them. The family sent it to LMC in Florida for an extensive refit over 18 months, eight months rather, that transformed the dark cherry wood interior into a light, bright and welcoming space, the design of which was overseen by uh, Sabina and her mother. Sabina is now a popular charter yacht, commanding from $150,000 a week. Matt, last but not least, is the owner of 56 Meter Broadwater and joins us today for the second time in the owner series after also starring in the session on Charter last time round. Matt has packed a huge amount of big boat experience into a little, little over a decade. In that time, he has owned four super yachts. The first one uh, was a Westport, but he soon moved on to his real love, classic fed ships. He has owned three to date each of which he has refitted with Charter in mind. His latest is the former Rasselas, now renamed Broadwater, currently 
almost finished its refit at Royal Houseman. Uh, thank you all very much for joining us. Um, let's uh, start by, uh, I've given everyone a taster of what you did to your boat, but perhaps it would be really interesting, I think, to just go to each of you and in your own words, just tell us quickly what you did with the refit and how uh, it went. So Sabina, why don't we start with you from New York? Tell us what you did with Bina. Um, so we basically took a boat that was owned by um, three men and um, had a lot of uh, dark cherry uh, wood, uh, dark leather, kind of a gentleman's cigar lounge type feel and gave her a makeover to become uh, your, our take on a Hamptons Beach House family boat. So um, all of the wood surfaces were repainted white, which was one of our, I, I think the biggest transformation and one of the, the, the biggest um, uh, challenges and uh, achievements in this refit. And um, and everything else, the, the soft goods, the decor sort of followed from that. Thank you very much. And you're very, obviously incredibly happy with the result. It's very personal family yacht now. It is. It is. We, we do charter it um, a few weeks a year, but it is our family yacht. Thank you. Mina, perhaps you could tell us a little bit, about, a little bit more about the phenomenal restoration uh, you did of the Spucci. Yes, so uh, indeed we started uh, the refit in uh, 2017 and uh, for us it was a, a challenge but we like those kind of challenges because uh, uh, my husband is also uh, a constructor and real estate, he has a real estate company so for us doing refits is in our, uh, in our heart I would say. Uh, we love that, and we like li we like also historical uh, when something is historical. So uh, the fact that it was a boat of uh, Carlo Riva was for us really something uh, something very special. So my husband knew the boat since he was little because there is a big uh, how do you say maquette uh, in uh, Monaco at the Riva Monaco. Um, so. When we started, uh, what was very important for us is uh, was to keep as much as possible the original fits of the boats, but really uh, doing uh, a full refit of uh, all the technological, all the machinery, and a restoration of uh, all the furniture and uh, where we could uh, bring some uh, new things, we did it. So uh, it's a really high-end... Um, uh, refit. Uh, one of the biggest changes was um, on the external side, it was uh, the complete uh, uh, renewal of the, the deck, of all the, of all the decks, um, all the bathrooms, um, all the electricity, all the, the water system, um, all, a, lot of, a lot of things. What was very difficult was uh, sometimes to uh, to to find the, the the best persons to understand what we really wanted. So um, we're very happy now with the, with the result, uh, and we could keep, I think, really the spirit of Carlo Riva uh, how it was uh, how it was in the beginning. Um, his uh, daughter and the granddaughter came on the boat, and they were extremely happy with the uh, with the refit thank you well you, you you're almost like the uh you you're maintaining a heritage with that boat so um we're trying yeah. yes yeah absolutely um matt you're an expert at refit now um i think that's the case so tell us uh, a bit about what you've done with your latest broadwater uh so um first of all i i want to um shout out to um, Sabina and to Mina the, the, the you have refit boats as have I. Um, and what we all know that means is different than changing a piece of carpeting, a piece of art or a pillow on a boat, which all too often um, the brokers and the charter people and reps want to, want to say and date. Um, we're talking about major work and major investment um, in 
um, bringing a boat up uh, up to current standards, and we the three of us have uh, have, have done that. With with the current broadwater, we were bestowed a, a rather beautiful classic um, fed ship that I'd always admired that had been thankfully well cared for, um, and but unchanged really. And, and this is a good thing, it turns out, unchanged since its launch, um, because I think it was so beautiful. Uh, and uh, because it was uh, a launch in the mid-90s, it needed um, a new approach to the sea and an embrace of the sea. It had a closed stern. And uh, so the biggest structural lift we've made uh, is um, a, a net extension of about four, uh, three and a half, four meters, um, which is like an overall extension of about five meters. Uh, and that includes a, a beach club and an approach to the sea um, and a lot of useful space that, that we were able to uh, accommodate engineering, um, life safety, uh, and uh, bringing a boat that had uh, never um, uh, been classed commercially into a commercial class so that we can chart it around the world, uh, which is part of our program and part of my crew. So um, heavy lift, yes. Uh, so that was the technical side. And then the interior has been completely renewed. And like Sabina was saying, um, this too was definitely uh, a, a gentleman's cigar lounge meet, meeting grandma's living room in some cases. Uh, and we have elevated that to sort of a, a modern Parisian historic um, a, apartment uh, and maintained uh, the priceless, which you can't get today, the priceless mahogany interior, um, but we've, we've painted it. Uh, we were very careful to use paints because in the 20 years from now, someone may want to take the paint off. Um, but the, the bones of this, is like, just like a good um, apartment in Paris, it's worth maintaining. You just have to update. Um, and thankfully we, we, we have designers who are um, blessed with uh, far greater vision than, than I have um, to bring this to realization. And I'm, I'm thrilled with the, the outcome. Thank you, Matt. Um, I'm gonna ask the next question of you because you've done this three times now. So what is it that you look for when you're out shopping for a boat to refit? What are the things you look for in that project? Uh, well, so first I think pedigree is important uh, with the boat um, and uh, so it, it has to have good bones. Um, I see boats today that are manufactured that I can't imagine being around in 20 years, let alone um, be, be, being retrofit. Uh, and, and so you're talking about, um, uh, you know, Italian yards of pedigree. You're talking about uh, Northern European yards of pedigree generally. Um, and, and then you have to look at how that piece of art um, uh, nautical art w was taken care of during its life. Um, and uh, to make sure that if, if, if this is not purely a passion play, but also a sort of business, which I try to make everything sort of a business, um, you, don't, you don't lose your shirt and passion, which I think the three of us have all done, but I don't, I don't know that we've done on our boats. Um, I admire greatly uh, uh, what, what Mina has done with, with her boat. Um, it's, it's just a gorgeous thing. And the interior, Sabina, that you put on your boat make me feel so comfortable and so at ease. Um, I just, I could curl up and, and have a glass of wine with you and feel just at home. Yeah. So, um, <laughs> but they're radical transformations and it's great. And so you mentioned good bones there and Sabina, I think that's something you found too in Bina. You looked at a lot of boats before you settled on Bina and the search started around 30 meters and grew and grew and grew. Yes. How many boats did you see before you found Beena and why was it Beena? Um, I don't remember exactly how many, but I I would say probably 40 or 50 uh, in a varying uh, sizes. Like you mentioned, we did start around 30 meters. We were uh, we were upgrading from a um, from a 24 meet uh, was it anyway from um uh, um from a 75 footer i think and yeah. um and it was time for for something bigger so but we started 
in small increments of bigger until we finally found, you know what, like we, we need to go, what for us at the time was sort of full hog. Um, and, um, you know, and that 40, 45 meter range was sort of sweet spot. Um, and we saw a few boats in, 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 in that size range, but when I stepped onto Bina, it just, it was, it was not my taste. It was completely different from what I had uh, envisioned that I wanted our boat to look like, but it had the bones and the bones were completely uh, visible and clear from the moment I stepped on. And uh, that's how we knew. And obviously you took some expert advice to make sure that those bones were solid. Um, of course, <laughs> that, uh, that I could not see with the naked eye. Yes, we did thorough surveys and uh, uh, like, Matt said the pedigree was important um, and the history of uh, I, I liked how he how he put that piece of uh, nautical art mm -hmm. because each boat is uh, is very individual, even if, uh, you know, Bina is is definitely not the only 43 meter Mondo Marine, but it it's history, the way it was built, the moment that it was built, uh, its exact features and specifications are completely unique to her. Yeah. Well, talk about history. Let's move on to Vespucci. I mean, um, when you found Vespucci, I think it's fair to say that it wasn't in the greatest condition, Mina. Is that, is that, about, no, is that accurate? Exactly, exactly. Um, when we found Vespucci, in fact, we rented a boat uh, in 2015, a sister ship of Vespucci. So, um, when uh, in, two, in, in December 2015, to say the little history, um, there was a, a famous boat uh, in, a, in an auction house, coming in, in an auction house, who was Moonbeam Tree. I don't know if you know him. It's a sailing boat, and my husband did live well de Saint-Tropez several times with Moonbeam 4. When I saw that he was looking at that boat to buy, I was, oh my God, this is impossible with kids. It's a, really not a boat for us, but I need to play it very, uh, very carefully. And uh, I cannot say, no, you cannot bid on this boat. I had to find something else that he put, he would put his eye on. So I, 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 uh, I asked, uh, I looked for, uh, for some ships uh, for, sa for sale and, um, so that that's how we come we came to Vespucci and um, yes for us it was uh, really uh, one of the only boats we saw it's uh, on the country of Sabina we we really uh, uh, immediately feel, fell in love with her and we only saw two or three boats uh, uh, before even without visiting the other boats um, so when we arrived there, um, my husband has been a, a, a Riva fan since a uh, little, uh, little boy. So his, his family uh, uh, owns several Rivas too. And um, so for us, yes, the historical of uh, the history of uh, Carlo Riva and seeing all the pictures uh, with uh, his family uh, on the boat and, uh, and also all the details, all the details like the... Um, how do we say to 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 put on the lights the the switches the switches and so on and all all these different the lights uh, by itself everything is very riva from uh, from that particular um, period so um, yes so you was, fell in uh, love with the idea of it the the project and the history yes and all. I think that's that's the first thing and you as like Sabina said. We arrived on the boat it, you feel it you feel it that that's right uh, that's something we we visited another boat a bigger boat two uh, two days ago in uh, Saint-Tropez uh, because the uh, 40 meters and the owner wanted uh, to ask us if we did not want to to change the boat <laughs> but uh, it's we did not feel the same thing it's, uh, oh. Uh, it would be a, a whole refit again, and uh, so we just finished this one. Uh, we were already thrilled, if maybe to to do some to do some new project, but uh, this one is, uh, yeah, for the moment we we like it very much, yeah. And I just want to, you did uh, the work at Monaco Marine in the south of France, and Matt, you your your work's happening in Holland, and Sabina, you did your refit in Florida. But Mina, I just wonder if we could just. How did you come to select Monaco Marine? Was, what, how many shipyards did you 
get quotes from? What would, can you tell us a bit more about that process? Well, for us, so we, we had the three quotes. Um, for us, it was very important uh, that we could visit the ship uh, a lot, as we live in Belgium, so it's not so far to go to uh, the south of France. It was Monaco, Monaco Marine in Antibes. And uh, our captain, who is the same captain since uh, since 2016, um, lives also close to there. And uh, as we have a big confidence in, in him, I must say uh, it was very important for us also uh, um, that that we, we found a good, sh the best uh, shipyard in this uh, area. So we had very good uh, response also from uh, from other people about the Monaco Marine and uh, that's why we worked uh, with him and uh, with them and uh, we were very happy with the refit with him and thank you Mina and Matt um, slightly controversially you took your fedship to Royal Houseman rather than fedship I was wondering uh, that process is really interesting but how many when you typically do a refit, how many quotes do you do you get? And do you need to have that personal relationship with the shipyard beforehand? Or tell us a bit more about that. Yeah, so I, I, I blame Hank DeVries for my owning this boat. Um, it was his it was his idea. Uh, we were in Monaco at the owner's dinner and uh, I, I brought it up and he said, yes, let's do it. Um, and then, um, of course, lots of people got involved in the mix and things got very expensive. Um, and my boat was at Royal Houseman at the time undergoing a, a special survey um, after I purchased it and shipped it over. Uh, I actually took possession of the boat mid major survey um, and we got some special exemptions and then the rest of it took place uh, at Royal Houseman and I was very impressed with them. So I used the fact that the boat was across the river um, at not, I mean, they're all competition, they all compete, but um, I don't think at, at first that Fedship thought that Hausman was uh, in the running because, oh, you know, they build beautiful sailboats. They don't, you know, they're not known for motor yachts. And um, uh, they had three other motor yachts being refit when my boat arrived and I was impressed with the work and I was impressed with the, the way they kept to a schedule and to a budget on, all of the early parts of the survey and the research that went into finally developing the spec. Um, and I will say that my, my project manager has uh, incredible depth. Um, he had just finished a boat at, at FedShip, a, a beautiful, huge, brand new yacht. Um, and so he had experience of both yards. And his feeling was that we would get um, special attention at Hausman because they desperately wanted this work. And um, I think he was mostly right in hindsight. Um, and uh, we, I, I know I will be incredibly, incredibly happy with uh, the, 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 the project. I too, Sabina, have um, undertaken refits in America. And as an American, I'd love to say that um, that was an optimal, optimal experience, but I, in my opinion, can tell you it was not. <clears throat> and uh, so one, the first of which was at Rabovich, um, which I nicknamed Rob the Rich. And the second is uh, at uh, at LMC, which you know we more managed, like I'm sure you did, you did with with captains and reps. Um, both products were great; they were well received in the market. Um, but uh, it was quite stressful, quite expensive, um, and there were inexplicable delays, uh, which is very different than what I've experienced um, in Europe, where uh, were it not for COVID. I have every confidence that the boat would have been launched within weeks of what our original um, our original date was expected to be. Well, let's let's talk about your experience, uh, Sabina. So, was was part of the choice about LMC? It was close to the home. Obviously, your brother's in Sao Paulo. You're in New York. It was yes. a location you could visit fairly easily. Exactly. I think the decision to um, to get the refit done in Florida was um, much like in Mina's case, very much geographical. Where uh, where would you know language not be a barrier, and where would travel and being able to um, visit the boat often uh, not be that much of a challenge either? So uh, that was the decision to do it in Florida. I will agree. Uh, the decision for uh, we also. Um, 
spoke with and visited a few different yards. And ultimately we opted for LMC because of their flexibility to for us to bring in our own vendors. They were, uh, it, it just seemed like a more flexible setup. And for refit virgins, uh, that just felt a little bit more comfortable than to be sort of in the hands of one company, one way. The downside of that is one uh, is what Matt was talking about is that you, you know, you have more people to deal with, more delays, more expenses. So, you know, in hindsight, if I were to do something like this again in an ideal scenario, I think I would um, opt to do a little bit more of what he did, which is a kind of, uh, uh, I'm not going to say a one-stop shop because refits are not like that, but um, but a, and I don't want to say a more professional setup, but a little bit less uh, figure it out as you go. Does that make sense, Matt? Does, is that hearing what you said? Yeah, I mean, you know, I've done, as Stuart has, he keeps pointing out, I feel like I'm being crucified because I'm dumb enough to have done this three times. Um, uh, the It's taken three times to get it correct, Sabina. And um, finally, I have crew, the right crew in place, and I have the right project managers in place that I can really trust um, that things are moving along. And, I've, and in this case, I've had to. Um, because I haven't been able to visit the boat because of the pandemic since uh, the end of February. Right. Yeah. yeah. We we appear to have just lost Mina. Uh, hopefully she'll be back shortly. Um, so she's probably having rosé or something. I'm so jealous of her. And of course, it gets Thank my favorite. You. She might have better things to do in Calvi. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, um, well, let, let, it's interesting you you raise those points there because how when you go refit is not an exact science or at least it doesn't appear to be like you have to go in with a with a healthy margin of error because you never know what you're going to find so budgeting for it is quite tricky so how much going in Sabina did you have to factor that in did you think well if it's not going to end up at that figure we can cope with it ending up at that figure etc you have to have a healthy respect for that margin of error going in. Is that fair? Yes. Um, well, thankfully, we had a little bit, you know, being in um, in uh, real estate development, I had a little bit, and, and my family, uh, we all had a little bit of experience with remodels and constructions and upgrades and things like that to know that time and budget are never, never turn out to be what you um, hope or plan for. So yeah, you have to have um, flexibility in your mind and in your wallet. Um, you also have to um, have a certain amount, uh, a certain um, firmness about where you want to be and where you where you don't want to get to, and um, and where you're willing to compromise. And I think planning plays a big role in that. Um, and and then of course you know there are things such as now we can say pandemics that are things that you don't uh, that you can never plan for and that will affect your plans. Yeah. Um, I want to. Uh, sorry, Mina, we lost you there for a second. But this is a great question. I want to pitch to you too. When you went, because oh, oh, we've lost Mina again. Um, Matt, we'll go to you. Given your experience, when you started, say your latest Broadwater. How close do you think, how close have you got to the spend that you wanted to spend? And do you have to factor in that? Well, so what, what Sabina was saying is, is, is spot on. There are also things you discover during the refit process while you're spending this time that you don't want to cannibalize time in the future. So your budget inevitably is going to creep up, but you're also getting value for that, whether it's time savings in the future or you have this open right now, you don't want to reopen it again. So you're going to do the right thing and fix it. Uh, that's why uh, people who probably follow us in boats and who will be the next owner of our boats will be well served by that by that philosophy. So inevitably, even with the best th pro project, you're going to have creep because you just don't know what you're going to get. On a percentage basis, we're about uh, maybe maybe 20% over um, our our original uh, original budget, 
you know, there's always an eye budget squish in there because I know there's inevitably going to be problems, but we also have done things that weren't, we weren't originally intending to do. So it's hard to go back to the original number because it's not the original, you've accomplished more than the original spec generally, or at least you hope you have. You get pissed off to Sabina's point, and you, that's why you have to be firm. If you're not getting value for additional money, that that that, that don't work. Um, and that's where we end up, um, you know, as owners having heads explode. I, Stuart, I literally yesterday got a, a, a purchase order approval for 70,000 euro for runners to put on the floors of my, my, my boat. And I, I said, you know, I think we put in all, all new wooden floors on the boat. We don't have carpets everywhere. Um, why on 70,000 euro that I call that boat math. These are boat numbers. Uh, I don't even want the runners. I think they're ugly. And I said, no way, but left unchecked. This is how some of the, the refit expenses, I mean, a that's it's a hundred thousand dollars almost. It, it just gets it gets out of control. So you have to stay involved. No one was trying to rip me off, by the way. That's what these things cost. I just don't want them. We don't need them, and I'm not going to pay for them. Um, and uh, these are things you have to stay on top of because if you don't, it will get a, a, a runaway train. Um, so how do you stay on top of them? Though obviously a competent project manager is key, but how involved should you be as the well, owner? Well, my, in this case, my chief stew knows full well that I don't want uh, runners. Uh, and she sent me the bill. She's like, I just wanted to run this by you because I thought this was expensive. And I'm like, expensive? That's two years of tuition at, at university. Uh, you know, you need to have some parity with the real world here. And um, uh, so we, we will not have runners and covers. <laughs> Outside, of course. But I don't want them inside. Uh, you know, if, if there's a problem with protection of, of the interior, why th then people need to be more careful. We do not need to um, excuse bad behavior. Uh, I don't I don't have covers in my house. I don't you know, uh, I don't I, I don't throw sheets over. My. We just uh, you're just stuttering a bit there, Matt. Furniture. We, we use these things. So. Can you hear me now? Yeah, yeah, you're good now. You're good now. Um, okay. Yeah, so but that's all on that. I just thought it was a funny thing. So No, yeah. I mean, yeah, getting a bill for $100,000 is uh, make anyone uh, crazy a little bit. Yeah, but the – so you can't be too strict with your budget. You have to – it's got to be a slightly soft line rather than a hard line. Um, but uh, – Guaranteeing value is a key point, and obviously, competent project manager is a good part of that. But when you, if the project does overrun, how do you manage that relationship with the shipyard? Do you enforce late fees? You don't want to lose the relationship. It's it's a tricky one to balance, isn't it? So, so Sabine, how how do you, in your experience, deal with that? It is a tricky one to balance um, because uh, most contracts have all these things built in. You know, if the boat is late, if you run over this or but um, enforcing them isn't always as easy because a lot of the time, at, at least with us, there there were many points where we were just okay, let's get this done. Let's get this out of there. Let's get enjoying this. I mean, you know, you're pushing uh, six months, seven months. We, in our case, went to eight months. You know? um, so there's, you have to balance the, the emotions and, the, uh, and what's rational. And also the, the relationship. End of the day, you know, uh, uh, our boats for, I think for, a lot of us, if not most of us, are babies, and they're you know they're they're in in the in in, in the nursery being taken care of until we can take them home, sort of thing. And um, it's 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 hard to be at odds with um, with your with your shipyard. Um, well, yeah, I mean they they they've got your boat. Um, <laughs> 
So well, it doesn't mean that you um, that you should just sit back and let them take you know do as they please. Not at all. It is still your property, and you have this is a fee for service uh, type of um, uh, a thing. But it, it it does become a lot more personal and emotional than I would have expected, at least. We yeah. had had an experience, Stuart, on the last refit, not on this one, where we had a vendor who was probably the number three or four vendor on the project. Uh, and um, I was unhappy with the quality of work. And we had, I think, 132 defects that we had um, we had measured. And we said, you need to come, before we pay you any more, you need to come back and fix what's been done. And they were like, nope, we're not going to do that. And I said, well, then I'm not going to pay you. And well, I had paid him what was due. He wanted the next payment, scheduled payment, to, to come back, fix what was not acceptable and deliver more. And I said, let's draw the line. Let's, he's like, well, I'm gonna arrest your boat. And I said, arrest my boat? I don't even know what that means. And so I said to my lawyer, what does that mean? And he's like, oh, well, they'll, they'll put a lien on your boat. Um, they'll cuff it to the dock, but we can have it uncuffed in an hour, and then you'll settle this in, in maritime court. I said, great, that sounds perfect. Um, my captain was mortified, the project manager. I was like, what are you guys afraid of? He's not giving us what we want. I'm not, all it costs me, I was never not gonna pay the guy, but he didn't get paid for a year and a half while we settled this in court. So they think they can push around people who in business never get pushed around and you've got to push back. Uh, and, and we got what we wanted out of that scenario. Unfortunately, the vendor waited a year and a half to get their money because he thought I wouldn't, I wouldn't fight him. And I said, no, I'm a perfectly nice guy, but I, I'm the, the harmed party, not you. Uh, I already paid him almost a million dollars. So, you know, Everyone needs to understand who the customer is and who's writing the checks. And it's important to sometimes remind everyone of that. So be firm, but reasonable. Sorry? Be firm, but reasonable. I'm obviously, yeah. Um, you, you, yeah. Ultimately, you're the one paying the bills, but if you, uh, perhaps you could take it too far, perhaps, and then it could damage the project ultimately. Is that, is that, is that fair? Yeah, but 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 ultimately you have to take you are you are the person in control, and yeah. there are plenty of these projects where no one is in control, and they spiral out of control. And some of the American, I would argue, this is more more so in America, are used to this absent owner situation, and they can just bill, bill, and bill, and the office pays the bills. And it's not until someone or other says this has gotten outrageously expensive, or the boat is a year late that they realize what has happened. And I'm not going to fall prey or victim to that. Yeah, I, I definitely feel like um, our uh, our contractors and our vendors were very surprised by um, the owner's involvement with Bina, uh, our family's involvement. Um, we did have a project manager on site, which was a very, very smart decision. Um, he was experienced and he was, uh, overall uh, an advocate for us since we were not there all the time. Um, but, uh, I agree with Matt, you have, you, you have to be there. There is some built-in flexibility to any refit uh, like we, we talked about, but you have to be firm. You cannot be taken for a ride. Otherwise, you know, the ride never ends. And we saw we saw boats that had been there for a couple of years, just yeah. kind of collecting dust. You don't really know. You don't, you know, are they coming back for it? Are they not? What, you know. Yeah. And and by the way, that's that's not LMC's fault. I, our, my boat goes to LMC. I very much like uh, the organization and the marina. Uh, Absolutely. No, no, this was not a reflection on the yard itself. Just the the dynamics of a of a of a refit. Yeah. Well, let's talk, Matt. In in your Broadwaters case, so you uh, Adam Voorhees is the designer of that boat, not a relation. I, I, no, I, I, everyone thinks he's your nephew yeah. or son or something. I know. Um, 
But uh, so you, but Sabina, in your case, you did the design yourself. And I'm just interested to dig into that a little bit because what challenges did that present? Because you become basically a full time designer, no? You and your mum did it together. So you're still talking to each other. <laughs> <laughs> Incredibly so, yes. Uh, we, so Bina was definitely um, our, our, wonderful broker Robert Shepard uh, who manages our, our our charters always says you know Bina should be renamed a family affair because it's exactly what it is we um, we were uh, my brother and my father sort of took care of uh, they have engineering backgrounds and took care of everything that was mechanical and technical that's their that's what they love that's their passion that was their vision and my mother and I um, did everything that was um, design and aesthetic and look and feel sort of thing. Um, and yes, I mean, uh, we'd had experience with uh, redoing homes. Um, a boat is always different. Uh, and it was, a, it was a huge learning experience, but it was a lot of fun. But it, and it also, it, we had this vision. We wanted to see it through. And the process was really important for us. Um, we, we're, we're a very close family, but we're scattered around the world. And this was really something that brought us together. Yeah. Um, but you sourced everything, right? I mean, every lampshade, every soft good. Yes. That's your work. Yes. It's a little bit crazy. I, I'm not, you know, uh, it's it's a lot crazy if I think now. But yes, uh, we did. We did. We were. Um, it, it was also a lot of fun. Right. I'm, I'm not going to lie, because, uh, you know, we there were a lot of crazy ideas that came up and all, you know, and so, you know, I got to have quite a bit of a, a, a of a chuckle at my mother sometimes and she definitely had her laughs at me and it re really was um it was a pre that was a, a really precious time and um, would you do it the same way again um yes i think i would i think i would especially having learned uh everything that i did now i don't I don't recommend it for everyone. This is uh, there were there were several times I think I, I I I've told you this before, Stuart, where I would just lay my head on the pillow and have this sort of like fantasy that I could just get the keys and give it to a designer and that I would just step in, you know, in three days' time and everything would be perfect the way that I wanted. But uh, so, uh, but ultimately. Yeah, I think I'd do it again. But yeah. it wouldn't be perfect like you wanted, Sabina, because you, you hadn't done it. I feel the same way. I mean, I, I have a designer um, to, to do this, but the we also allow time for me to then personalize the boat. So as Absolutely. talented as Adam is, um, I don't want to live in Adam's boat. I want to live in mine. And um, it's very important for the boat to feel feel like home and to feel precious and to feel familiar. Um, at least for me, it's it's not a it's not a museum. It's it, it's something that has uh, that is passionate and is used and is part of the sea and we uh, and is not too precious. One hundred percent. What I'm hearing from both of you is that whilst it's important to have a really competent project manager to deal with all the subcontractors and um, some of the the more finer details of it, as an owner, it's critical that you stay involved and engaged throughout the process, or you will lose control of it. Is that reasonable? I think that's Matt. fair. Yeah. That's very fair. It, it also, you know, it really depends on what your risk tolerance is for losing control. Uh, ours was fairly low, and what I'm engaging for Matt is his is also very calculated, uh, much like ours. So, uh, yeah. You, you have to be involved if you want to maintain a, uh, some control. Yeah. And I just wanted, um, given everything that you know now, before we get to the questions, because I'm just aware of the time, given everything that you know now, uh, what what is your kind of golden nugget of advice to someone considering a refit for the first time? And what lessons, uh, what, what do you wish someone had told you before you had embarked on this process? Sabina, why don't, why don't you answer that one first? Plan. 
and budget, plan and budget, and and have um, have a vision definitely of what you want and what you want it to feel like, what you want it to look like. Um, but also be prepared for a little bit of uh, compromise, uh, maybe some disappointment here and there, uh, but plan and budget. Don't wing it. Yeah, don't wing it. A great, that's a great, great thing. <laughs> for most things, I guess. Well, well, I echo Sabina. I mean, Sabina, can you imagine if we we ran our organizations uh, on land, like we run our project on the boat, we wouldn't be able to afford the boat. Exactly. Um, yeah. So uh, there's a little bit of uh, uh, suspension of disbelief or wishful, oh, God, I, I, you know. Um, but I agree, you planning. I mean, one of the reasons why this refit has gone so well on the current boats, Stuart, is that we spent six months with the boat in Holland, narrowing every decision down um, before we even started on the refit. And oftentimes, and I'm victim of this, I'm so excited about the boat, I wanna get in there and I wanna start. And you, there's a pace that if you're gonna end up in a good place budget-wise, if you're gonna end up in a good place with completion and the product, it takes some time and you should allow for some time on the front end. Yeah. Absolutely. Great. Thank you both. We're going to, we're going to hit some questions now. Um, the top one um, is question for Mr. Voorhees. How important is it to integrate today's technology in a 20 year old yacht? Uh, you have a brand new glass bridge in your boat. So very important. I, I do. We, we have a brand new rhodium. I mean, one of the things I'm most excited about is I have this classic fed ship that you would expect to go into the wheelhouse and see you know, big screen, like radar, weird things. I wouldn't even know how they work. And um, uh, we have put in a state of the art, uh, rhodium, all glass, paperless bridge um, with a huge chart, uh, a voyage planner. So as, a, as myself can meet with the captain or a charter guest can meet with the captain and go, they can just move it like around table um and then during this trip to the queue um it, it it's fun uh and, and in this case we we had because of our 25 year um survey there were a lot of things to upgrade on the boat and it ended up being if if we could have replaced in kind everything that was on the boat or upgraded to this rhodium um bridge which is state of the art and the cost differential was almost nil when you looked at both things, um, uh, apples to apples. Uh, well, it's a no brainer. In business, you would say, oh, well, whatever puts us forward um, is wonderful. All too often in boating, whether it's class or conservative captains or whatever, they're like, oh no, go with what's known. Um, and so it takes an owner to push, uh, to say, no, it's okay, we're gonna do this. Um, so I think it's imperative when you're when you're spending millions of dollars uh, that you have some fun with technology. I'm in I'm in that business and uh, and and push the envelope a little bit. And we, we we certainly have in this project. So, well, I guess you just want to avoid being back in a shipyard eighteen months later installing a whole new thing. No way, no, no, because that that's the other component of this. What Sabina talked about is time. So my crew knows. That boat is not going back into a yard until next spring. And that will be a very well-planned, very narrow window of all warranty work, which there will be plenty until I come over uh, in late May for my birthday to enjoy the boat on the sol shoulder season. And that's all they're going to have. It it's already been there for a year and a half, but we're, we're good. <laughs> right, <Thank Stephen? laughs> Yeah, well, Sabina, I know your, your your brother and your dad kind of handled the more hardware side of yeah. the project, but again, you know, as, as, I suppose you'd agree with a lot of what, what Matt said. Is that absolutely? Um, 
yes. I mean, you, especially in today's world where technology uh, this week uh, is going to be surpassed by next week's technology, you 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 have to take a few you have to take a few risks and you have to um, be open to what is new. Um, I think that's very important. Great, thank you both. Um, a question for you, Sabina. Uh, for the Moto Yacht Bina, what is the part of the layout that you think is more useful for the charter life? Uh, part of the layout that is more. Um, so one thing that was a, a really big part of the uh, of the 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 refit and um, is we had all the 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 tenders and toys and the aft deck when we first got the boat, and we we did a, a whole study to be able to move um, the, the jet skis and, and the water toys to the, the front of the boat so that we could free up um, that aft deck space. And it became one of the best entertaining spaces um, on the boat. Uh, and even though it is one uh, deck, we have a dining area, we have a sitting area, and we find that for charter guests it and, and for our use, it ends up being um, a really nice sort of outdoor main salon. And that and that's something your guests appreciate. Um, yeah. Yes, yes. Yeah. I think everybody ends up gravitating sort of there, and um, it's it's um, it's an it's large enough. Uh, that it doesn't, it's definitely not cramped and you can have different sort of, um, you can have the children there and you can have uh, the grandparents there and you can have, uh, you know, uh, uh, any late risers having sort of a, a, an 11 a.m. breakfast at the table. You can, you, a lot of things can be going on at once um, in an outdoor space. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um. The next question actually leads on quite nicely from that. I'm going to uh, so direct this to you, Matt. So how much did the intention to put the yachts on the charter market influence the interior design and style of your last refit? Last refit? Or your, your, your current one? Yeah, well, they all do. Um, because I'm buying uh, pedigreed boats, they, they tend to be more formal and we need to, we need to make this feel more like a Hamptons Beach Club, to be in um, uh, description. Uh, that's general. You want people to walk uh, in any of my homes, offices, or the boat. I want people to walk on and feel comfortable and exhale. I don't want to feel like I'm visiting my grandparents or going to the country club and have to have a jacket and tie on. Um, that's not how I live. I've worked really hard not to live that way. Um, and I certainly don't want a boat that represents that way. So. Uh, yes, we run a family charter program and our interiors um, embrace kids. Uh, you know, my, I have only one child, but I'm one of five and my mother has 11 grandchildren, um, nine of which are boys. And so when we all get together on the boat, it's a it's a just it's a mess um, and it, it drives the crew nuts, but it's magical and fine for three days. And then I kick all my family off and I can relax. So um, but but. But what's good for us is good for charter. Um, and uh, we, we believe that strongly, except the, for the fact that we don't watch TV. And apparently, according to every charter broker, everyone on charter watches TV, which I don't understand because you're at the sea and you should be enjoying nature. Um, but I have spent more money on audiovisual systems on these boats than I, I just, it's, it's amazing to me that someone would want to sit inside and watch a, a movie when you could be out on the boat someplace but you've got a as a successful charter you have to have that you have to check, you have to check a base level box um which which we exceed that of course but um some of it's like the charter broker i'm like do you really charter a boat and watch tv and then you find out no the guests don't watch tv they might watch the news in the morning or if it's bad weather watch a movie but there's nature out there it's gorgeous it's beautiful so yeah yeah. Um, captains is about the next question. <clears throat> we just have time to squeeze this one in. 
Um, so, captains, how important is your captain in the decision making process about which shipyard you choose? How much do you lean on your captain, uh, Sabina? So, uh, I'm having a little bit of a hard time recalling, but I think uh, at the time, the captain that we had did kind of steer us a little bit uh, uh, in the right direction because we really did not know um, where to start. But ultimately, uh, we uh, we ended up leaning more on the uh, project manager once we, we identified and picked a project manager. Um, there, uh, he had the most experience with... A, a couple different yards gave us, you know, uh, what really felt like his honest uh, opinion of pros and cons. And we kind of went with what we thought was going to be the best fit for us. Um, but I do think that it depends. Uh, we we had just bought this boat and had just met this captain. Um, if this is a refit um, that you're doing to a boat that you already own or a captain that you already um, know well and have a relationship with, um, then, uh, you know, that completely changes the dynamics. Yeah, absolutely. And um, what about you, Matt? How your captain's been with you for a while? So, yeah, uh, well, we, we knew we were going to a, a European Dutch yard. Um, I think if you had, uh, bet money with my captain, he, he would tell you that we were going to be at Fed Ship and we're at Royal Houston. Uh, so, um, you know, this was a, not a group decision because I'm, I have relationships in the industry too. My project manager has even deeper relationships and that's who I really rely on to make sure that we get the best timing, the best value. Um, and ultimately, you know, it, it's, do, do they have the, the ability to deliver the boat? Never mind the money, never mind when you want it delivered. We, we never get a day in this life back. And so, um, it's vitally important. Time is my, my, my most valuable asset. And so you have to balance all three of those things. Someone can promise something and if they can't deliver, it doesn't matter. Yeah. Thank you both. Um, the next one's not a question, rather a statement, and it's addressed to you both. Thank you for sharing your stories and experiences as owners. It's very special to hear the love, passion and enthusiasm you put into your yachts. Uh, they almost become family members. Thank you. Um, thank you. Matt and Sabina, thank you very much. And to Mina, if you're listening somewhere in Calvi with a lovely glass of rosé, thank you very much uh, for the brief time you were with us. It's a shame that didn't work out because um, Vespucci, uh, I love that boat. It is such a special boat. Um, thank you both for joining us and to everyone for watching. Um, I hope you found it interesting and enlightening. Uh, we'll shortly send you a feedback form uh, that we would love to you to complete. Uh, the more we hear from you, the more we can improve these sessions. Um, there's a slide coming up. There it is. Uh, we hope that you can join us for the next one uh, on July the 30th, where we'll be talking to some owners who have done some really incredible um, things in their boats. Uh, that's it from me, Matt and Sabina. Again, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. And again, thanks everybody for watching. And we shall see you next time. Bye-bye.